Greetings from the far side of the wormhole nexus, and welcome to the Vorecast, a podcast about Lois McMaster Bujold's Vorkosigan Saga. My name is Daniel Galsworth, and I would like to welcome you all back to episode four, where we'll finish reading through the first installment of the Vorkosigan Saga, the short story Dreamweaver's Dilemma. But first, a little housekeeping. The first thing I'd like to bring up is the r the Vorecast subreddit. I recently pinned a feedback thread, so if anybody has any comments, questions, or constructive criticisms, I would encourage you to share those thoughts on that thread. For starters, I've been thinking about this very housekeeping section. The topics for this section are things like announcements, corrections, or public acknowledgments of particularly noteworthy questions or comments from you guys. I think of most of the topics while listening through the previous episode and picking up on things I think could have been explained more clearly or ideas that I forgot to touch on. Also, I tend to discover information while researching the current episode that would have been relevant to the previous episode. All this seems reasonable enough, but my concern as a content creator is that revisiting things from the last episode just shows my lack of preparation for that episode and also messes with the pacing of the current episode. My intention is to try to, as much as possible, clearly and completely state the ideas I want to convey about the contents of an episode within that episode. So I hope you guys will see improvement in that area as the podcast continues. If anybody has any thoughts about what I just said, the feedback thread is the place to go. And I already have a comment on a topic started. On a related topic, I have never moderated any kind of anything online And although I do intend to go over all the helpful information Reddit provides to new mods, I have been prioritizing my energy on getting the podcast out since my workflow is still evolving and inefficient. My limited experience of interacting on forums consists of a few traumatizing attempts where my initial enthusiasm about joining a community quickly mutated into mortification after being publicly shamed by the mods for breaking forum rules with my initial spate of postings. I really try to do research about forum etiquette before I attempt to participate, but I inevitably miss some vital piece of information that is posted so obviously that I don't see it. I'm saying this in support of the declaration that I don't know what I'm doing as a Redditor and or a moderator. So, at least for now, please bear with me as I catch up. Even this week, I somehow fucked up posting about the podcast for the self-promotion Saturday on the r sci-fi subreddit. My post was automatically removed, so I must already be put on some kind of list. I'm truly inept at forums. One further podcast-related topic. In all my imaginings of what the process of making this podcast would require, I totally did not realize to what extent I would have to flex my atrophied voice acting muscles, even though it seems so obvious now. The fact is that I am really enjoying doing these voices and trying to impart the emotion and natural dialogue delivery that will make Lois's characters come to life for you guys. It seems that after all my years of listening to audiobooks, I must have picked up enough of an understanding of the art of voice acting to know that I am terrible at it, but also to have a feeling of what areas of my performance need the most improvement. For instance, Despite my best efforts, I kept falling into a southern drawl while doing Chalmis, even though he's supposed to be from Ohio. And there are more than a few takes of Kinsey's dialogue that are nothing more than an offensive caricature of the voice of a gay man. In an effort to improve, I started watching YouTube videos about the Ohio region's accent, and then I thought, Lois is from there, so I started watching interviews with her on YouTube. This is something I probably should have been doing anyway, but it just didn't occur to me. Anyway... I'm going to binge as many as I can and report back to you guys later. And, speaking of Lois being from Ohio, Lois is from Ohio, and I knew that from reading her biologue in the first episode, so I missed the opportunity to point this out in the last episode when Anais is talking about the radioactive area just below the big lake, to which Chalmers replies, Cleveland. If I had remembered this fact about Lois... I would have mentioned how interesting it was that she nuked her hometown in her first short story. Also, the other day I was starting to look through the Vorkosigan GURPS manual, and I came across this quote from Lois herself in the Playing Guide's Basic Galactic History section. Quote, This disaster wiped out Cleveland, and maybe some other cities I dislike. End quote. After a little more research, I found the interview where Lois said this in the Answers section of the Dreamweaver's Dilemma collection. 
Here I found a few more quotes that reference the Dreamweaver's Dilemma story, so I thought I would share them with you all after reading the introductory paragraph to that section. Quote, This essay was generated from two phone interviews with Lois on July 11th and 27th of 1995. I had sent her seven pages of questions in preparation. I have edited and reorganized our conversation and deleted the extraneous parts, like most of my questions and remarks. If the structure or phrasing appears occasionally awkward, blame me. Any remnants of my part are in a different font, like this. Suford Lewis. End quote. The disaster wiped out Cleveland quote comes from the section in Answers where Lois breaks down the historical timeline of her universe. The following quote does have some mild spoilers about the existence of characters and places and confirms some things that were only implied in this first story. Lois refers to her universe on Dendarii.com as the Vercosiverse, but in this quote she calls it the Beriaran universe, which is a reference to a civilization in the main timeline of the series. Quote, My initial timeline for the prehistory of the Beriaran universe is that in the 21st century, perhaps the early 22nd century, there was an initial push for interstellar colonization, and they got out some ships, not exactly generation ships, but ships that took 20 years to get there. A couple of nearby stars were attempted to be colonized, nearby meaning within 40 light years of Earth. One of these was Alpha Colony, which looked biologically promising, but utterly failed, like Roanoke, where they found carvings on a tree and no other signs of what had happened. Another was Beta Colony, which was a howling desert world and looked much less promising, and upon which people lived as if they were digging their spaceships into the soil. That turned out to be, oddly enough, more successful. Beta Colony was colonized from the United States. There was some sort of late 21st, early 22nd century disaster that put everybody out of the space business for a little while, and Beta Colony was cut off for a bit. Not that they ever had much contact beyond the initial colonization but it did not lose its technology, its history, or its contact. There was a hiatus, and the wormhole jump drive was discovered, and exploration began explosively in all directions, but no wormhole jump to Beta Colony was discovered right away. And, in fact, the route from Earth to Beta Colony was quite roundabout when they finally did punch through and get access again. I don't go into astronomical detail. People who know that stuff can fill in appropriate, correct ideas, and people who don't need not be troubled with it. Get the reader to do the work, or not, if they choose. This disaster wiped out Cleveland and maybe some other cities I dislike, and then put America out of the space colonization business. So Beta Colony had actually descended from the United States, but everything else is descended from more mixed world cultures. Not that the U.S. isn't a mixed world culture to start with. That's what was going on before wormhole jumps. The Chalmers Dubauer character in Dreamweaver's Dilemma is an ancestor of the Dubauer who appears in Shards of Honor. All right, a little spoiler there, but I kind of, you know, it's really not a big deal. <laughs> it's cool, though. It's cool. And if you guys already knew that, then, you know, you must have been enjoying the fact that that name is a history in the lore of the universe. Continuing. When the disaster happened, one ship went back to try to make contact with Earth and see what had happened. They sent him back, although he left children on the colony. By the time he got back to Earth, the dust had settled and a whole new ballgame was in progress. In the back of my mind, I was working out Chalmers' history. I had him make a couple of other sub-light trips to Beta Colony, which is why he's out of phase in terms of his age. They were traveling close enough to the speed of light, sub-light, for Einstein's dilation effects to occur. So he ended up visiting his own great-granddaughter when he eventually made it back to Beta Colony. But everybody he'd known was dead by then, so he returned to Earth and eventually retired when the wormhole jump piloting started. His job became technologically obsolete. End quote. I had not read Dreamweaver's Dilemma or any supplemental material about the Vorkosiverse prior to starting this podcast, so I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back for the confirmation of the conjectures I made about the Earth's history in the last episode even though I did overlook the Ohio connection. Also, it's funny that she predicted assholes like me would do her physics math for her. Kind of reminds me of the story of the mob of MIT students that chanted, The ring world is unstable! at Larry Niven at a con in the early 70s. I think he added some tech in the next book of that series to address that issue. The next topic of housekeeping is on the rant about pornography I went on in the last episode. While I mostly work from a script... 
If I do manage to string together an improvised coherent group of ideas, I will include them if only to break up my stilted attempts at reading aloud, even if the contents of that rant haven't been researched fully. So after listening to the last episode, I decided that maybe a Google search on the concept of pornography driving the development of technology might be worth the effort. And it turns out that I may have been wrong about many individual examples, but correct about the concept as a whole. In one article I found from Thrillist.com, Eight Ways Pornography Influenced Technology by Jeremy Glass from 2014, the author pretty much backed up every claim I made point by point from the VHS Betamax story to the dominance of porn content on the internet. Glass concluded the article with some predictions for the future of porn and Google Glass, which made me giggle. The other article I found was written a year later in 2015 for digitaltrends.com, and it's entitled, Does Porn Still Have the Power to Push New Tech or Has It Gone Soft? by Eric Buckman, who I will not blame for that article's title since they are usually written by the editor. This article is relatively germane and short, so I'm going to read the whole thing, mostly anyway. Quote, Porn. It's everywhere. By some estimates, pornographic material make up 99% of the internet. Okay, I made that stat up, but it feels like it could be real, especially if you're a parent to a teenage boy, or if you're a teenage boy. Not surprisingly, there's a popular belief in the tech world that if you want your new technology to succeed, you need the backing of the porn industry. The example cited most is the VHS versus Betamax battle for home video supremacy back in the late 70s and early 80s. As the tale goes, Sony's Betamax format had the better video and audio quality, but VHS won in the end because more pornographic distributors backed it. Much like my made-up stat up above, it's a tale that feels true, so it gets retold over and over again every time a new format war is on the horizon. We heard it during the Blu-ray vs. HD DVD awards. It came up during the early stages of the Android vs. iOS debate, and it's starting to pop up in discussions about the competing virtual reality formats currently vying for the marketplace. But is it even true? Well, it is true that Sony had a policy against pornographic materials, whereas the VHS backers didn't. And it's also true that VHS was the cheaper format to mass produce, an attractive option for low-cost, in quotes, independent filmmakers. And yes, it's completely true that much of the earliest content for VHS was X-rated. But as Patchen Bars finds in his book, The Erotic Engine, How Pornography Has Powered Mass Communications from Gutenberg to Google, Betamax had no shortage of X-rated contents either, as Sony's policy only affected material the corporation produced itself. Bars looked into the porn killed Betamax myth and found that it was just that, a myth. What really killed Betamax in the consumer marketplace? A single technological limitation. Betamax videotapes could only hold an hour of content. Sure, porn producers preferred VHS because their tapes had twice the runtime, but so did everyone else. Though Bars found porn's role in the home video format war to be overstated, if non-existent, he did find that porn did have one major effect on the home media as an overall industry. Bars writes, In 1979, less than 1% of American households owned a video cassette recorder. How could VCR companies survive with such dismal market penetration? It was thanks to pornography consumers who were willing to pay top dollar for both the machines and the tapes. That premium helped offset the small size of the market and kept it viable for everyone from VCR manufacturers to local rental stores. In other words, people willing to pay dearly for the ability to watch skin flicks from the comfort of their own home helped keep the entire home video industry afloat long enough for the tech to mature and become affordable for the masses. It makes sense because you know who didn't embrace video cassette recorders at first? The mainstream Hollywood studios. They were scared to death of the R in VCR. Worried about piracy, they were slow to release content in any home video format. Porn producers filled a very important hole. All right. Ugh, Jesus. Um, let's not focus. All right, yes. And then he acknowledges he's made a pun. Very good. Okay. Pornography companies are not the secret deciders that many people make them out to be. They're simply willing to go wherever the customers are, indiscriminate of medium or format. The real power, as always, lies with the consumers. And the real lesson? Never underestimate the lengths people will go to look at naked pictures, as that has been the real secret driver of some cool new technologies, such as 
e-commerce. Back in the early 90s, people were willing to pay for porn, even on dial-up, but they wanted some assurance their credit card info was safe. Porn websites were forced to adopt safer methods for online transactions years before Amazon or eBay came around. Broadband internet service. As with VCRs, Hollywood studios were also slow to embrace the web as a video distribution tool, again afraid of piracy, though this time they were right to be scared. Back in the late 90s, broadband ISPs were still able to make some major inroads despite the lack of quality content. Studio fare, like American Beauty, might not have been streaming back in the year 2000, but American Booty was, end quote. That wasn't actually the entire article. He goes on to make an interesting point about why online streaming services beat video-on-demand services offered by cable companies because video-on-demand and pay-per-view were mostly associated with porn in the past. A good point, but I couldn't take any more porn puns. Of course, in 2022, the rise and general acceptance of the use of and performance for the website OnlyFans, stemming from the isolation and economic hardship of the COVID-19 pandemic, could be considered an industry mover both for consumers and for distribution platforms, as well as a breakthrough in destigmatization. Also in that article, he states that the porn industry was actually backing HD DVD, not Blu-ray, which is a fact I can actually confirm from experience. When I was working in LA, I worked on a reality TV show about plastic surgeons in Beverly Hills. In one episode, we filmed a very famous porn star at the time, Jessie Jane, having her breast implants replaced. Towards the end of shooting her episode, she gave everybody on the small crew a copy of her latest title, Pirates, which was an attempt to ride the coattails of the pirate craze in the aughts. This was the highest budgeted porn ever produced at the time and included full CG action sequences. It was even edited down to a softcore version and made available for rent in the new release section at Blockbuster. The DVD she gave us included three discs, the film on a standard resolution DVD, a disc for behind-the-scenes content, and another version of the film on HD DVD. I still see the softcore version of this film floating around the streaming services, so check it out if you want. The next topic of housekeeping falls under the category of things I forgot to mention in the last episode. If you haven't read Dreamweaver's Dilemma, then my description of Anais and Chalmers' relationship might have sounded like some kind of inexplicable and awkward friend-mentor type thing, similar to that of Doc Brown and Marty in Back to the Future. I believe John Mulaney has a stand-up bit about the strangeness of their relationship. Like, yeah, why would they know each other? What would they possibly have in common? The thing I forgot to mention is that Anais and Chalmers' relationship does include commitment-free casual sex. This information makes their relationship more explicable and also explains a little more why Chalmers, the noted recluse, is so willing to become embroiled in Anais' drama. A few more quick things. There is a mention of a poem in the last episode that Kinsey wants Anais to record so she will set off the booby-trapped dream synthesizer called Doreen's Gift. I googled this and it does seem to only exist in the Vercosifers. There is an entry for Doreen's Gift in the Vercosifers concordance, but it just confirms that Dreamweaver's Dilemma is the only story where it is referenced. It just seems like such a specific reference to something that I'm going to make a guess that it might have been some kind of inside joke between Lois and the people she was planning on showing her story to. I also want to quickly touch on the organic versus non-organic electronics topic from the last episode. Even though I made the point that organic electronics were a dead end as far as serious computation, I neglected to mention that almost impossibly complex organic computer that is writing these very words, the human brain. The size of neurons are in the range of 4 to 100 micrometers, which is larger than both the size of a bacteria and the size of a transistor in 1982. Yet, the human brain is capable of processing more information, if not at the speed of the fastest modern computer, but of a more generalized type than any computer. Considering that fact, and also that the brain runs incredibly cool and efficiently for all the processes it performs at once, I decided to Google computer versus human brain and got a bunch of good articles. I'm going to quote, though, from the incredibly quaint faculty dot washington dot edu page neuroscience for kids which despite being updated recently still does appear like it was made in 2002 all the contents of this website seem to be created by eric h chudler the article is called the brain versus the computer and it is presented in two columns labeled similarity and difference okay so here we are 
faculty.washington.edu brain versus computer for on the neuroscience for kids section here and uh, I gotta say that the rendering of the neuron that he has made here is terrifying and just looks like some kind of parasite which god that's an interesting that would be an interesting sci-fi concept huh if what if neurons were just parasites that you know had some sort of group consciousness kind of deal you know i don't know hmm all right well let's stay on topic i'll read through this little cute little article the brain versus computer quote Throughout history, people have compared the brain to different inventions. In the past, the brain has been said to be like a water clock and a telephone switchboard. These days, the favorite invention that the brain is compared to is the computer. Some people use this comparison to say that the computer is better than the brain. Some people say that the comparison shows that the brain is better than the computer. Perhaps it is best to say that the brain is better at doing some jobs and the computer is better at doing other jobs. Let's see how the brain and the computer are similar and different. Yay. Similarity. Both use electrical signals to send messages. Difference. The brain uses chemicals to transmit information. A computer uses electricity. Even though electrical signals travel at high speeds in the nervous system, they travel even faster through the wire in a computer. Similarity. Both transmit information. Difference. A computer uses switches that are either on or off, binary. In a way, neurons in the brains are either on or off by firing an action potential or not firing an action potential. However, neurons are more than just on or off because the excitability of a neuron is always changing. This is because a neuron is constantly getting information from other cells through synaptic contacts. Information traveling across a synapsis does not always result in an action potential. Rather, this information alters the chance that an action potential will be produced by raising or lowering the threshold of a neuron. Similarity. Both have a memory that can grow. Difference. Computer memory grows by adding computer chips. Memories in the brain grow by stronger synaptic connections. Similarity. Both can adapt and learn. Difference. It is much easier and faster for the brain to learn new things, yet the computer can do many complex tasks at the same time, multitasking, that are difficult for the brain. For example, try counting backwards and multiplying two numbers at the same time. However, the brain also does some multitasking using the autonomic nervous system. For example, the brain controls breathing, heart rate, blood pressure at the same time it performs a mental task. Similarities. Both have evolved over time. Difference. The human brain has weighed in at about 3 pounds for about the last 100,000 years. Computers have evolved much faster than the human brain. Computers have been around for only a few decades, yet rapid technological advancement has made computers faster, smaller, and more powerful. Similarity. Both need energy. Difference. The brain needs nutrients like oxygen and sugar for power. A computer needs electricity to keep working. Similarity. Both can be damaged. It is easier to fix a computer. Just get new parts. There are no new or used parts for the brain. However, some work is being done with transplantation of nerve cells for certain neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease. Both a computer and a brain can get sick. A computer can get a virus and there are many diseases that affect the brain. The brain has built-in backup systems in some cases. If one pathway in the brain is damaged, there is often another pathway that will take over this function of the damaged pathway. Similarity. Both can change and be modified. Difference. The brain is always changing and being modified. There is no off for the brain. Even when an animal is sleeping, its brain is still active and working. The computer only changes when new hardware or software is added, or something is saved in memory. There is an off switch for a computer. When the power to a computer is turned off, signals are not transmitted. Similarity. Both can do math and other logical tasks. The computer is faster at doing logical things and computations. However, the brain is better at interpreting the outside world and coming up with new ideas. The brain is capable of imagination. Last one now. Similarity. 
Both brains and computers are studied by scientists. Scientists understand how computers work. There are thousands of neuroscientists studying the brain. Nevertheless, there is still much more to learn about the brain. In quotes, there is more we do not know about the brain than what we do know about the brain. Okay, and that's the end of our little breakdown. So there is actually quite a bit of computational potential available in an organic format evidenced by the brain. But as far as we understand the development and application of consumer type electronics, uh, it does not seem likely that I still I still argue that the future is not going to be artificial organic brains running everything. I mean, I, I it possibly could, but just uh, seems unlikely. Oh, yeah. And I also just wanted to think how it was interesting how he described that the neurons were on off and there was like a probabilistic state, which is like kind of interesting because that's a, analogous to uh, how a quantum computer works. So well, it's kind of just kind of something to think about. Okay, and with that, and a quick mention that the forecast is now also available on YouTube, we will continue with the final part of our breakdown of Dreamweaver's Dilemma. Hello, fellow Vorkies. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at thevorecastpodcast at gmail.com or send me a message on Instagram at thevorecast, all one word. That's T-H-E-V-O-R-C-A-S-T. Please rate review, like, follow, and or subscribe to the Vorecast on whatever podcast platform you use. Thanks, and always remember, forward momentum! Previously in our story, Anais Ray travels to Ohio to stay with her friend and lover, Chalmis Dubauer, to work on the disturbing feely dream for Kinsey. Chalmis is a former near-light-speed spacecraft captain who, as a result of time dilation, is 160 years displaced from the timeline of his childhood and early adulthood. Chalmus lives on a large property which is enclosed with an energy shield to prevent trespassing as well as to keep out the giant radioactive mosquitoes. After completing the Feely Dream and disclosing the nature of its contents to Chalmus in a fit of conscience, Anais travels back to Rio and meets with Kinsey. Kinsey pays for the Feely Dream with a paper check and asks Anais for another short commission, which he will be back to pick up the following day. It is revealed that Kinsey had managed to sabotage Anais' dream synthesizer in an attempt to kill her by burning out the electronics implanted into her brain. Anais immediately suspects Kinsey, calls the police, and then travels back to Chalmers' to hide out. There, Anais and Chalmers realized that the disturbing Feely Dream she made was to be used as a form of psychic driving that could potentially cause the dreamer to kill himself. Desperate to get the dream back before it can cause harm, Anais and Chalmers set bait that will hopefully lure Kinsey to travel to Chalmers' property to try and finish off Anais. Anais as a character is funny because although her behavior makes sense for the most part scene by scene, when looked at as a whole, you wonder what kind of person would act like this and that. For example... The last few events in Anais's past include a very narrowly escaped attempt on her life, an attempt that was not only highly premeditated, organized, and well-funded, but also extremely violent in its execution. I can only imagine Anais's head beginning to glow like a light bulb as smoke comes out of her ears and flames come out of her eyes, nose, and mouth. Either that, or her head simply exploding, which is probably a painless way to die, if not dignified. And because of that, it makes sense that Anais is tense and anxious as she and Chalmers wait to see if Kinsey, her attempted head exploder, shows up. Lois writes, quote, The days that followed were dreadful for Anais. Having no other work to do, her hyperthyroid imagination occupied itself building towering cities and intricate labyrinths of further speculation on the narrow foundation of their facts which she could not help inflicting on Chalmers. It was a strain on their relationship, fortunately balanced by his sense of proportion and dry humor. In self-defense, he ordered and paid for a new synthesizer for her, but as it could not be delivered for at least a week, he had to endure. He finally accused her of being as bad as a kid waiting for Christmas, which restrained her somewhat. End quote. You can see that even here, Lois is starting to shift the tone of this encounter from dread to anticipation. And as a reader, I go along with it, even though something doesn't quite seem right in terms of the gravity of the stakes at play. 
we find out that the police investigation back in Rio, led by Lieutenant Mendez, has revealed that Rudolph Kinsey was an alias and that there was no physical evidence to help identify him. We also find out that Chalmers' neighbor happens to be the local sheriff. Here we encounter another dilemma, that of what to do with the man, aka Kinsey, if and when he shows up. They might be able to just arrest him, but while this would ensure Anais' future safety, it would likely not help them retrieve the Feely Dream in the time needed to prevent it from doing its damage, which is only a few days of exposure from what Anais figures. Lois does a great job of integrating this ticking clock element naturally. In fact, I didn't even realize that's what she had done until writing the second draft of this script. And then, quote, Thursday evening, Anais was passing the study when she heard the bell from the front gate. Her heart jumping, she went to the screen and keyed it in. Rudolph Kinsey appeared, smiling toothily. Oh, Anais managed. Fancy seeing you here. She mentally kicked at her paralyzed reason, hoping it would produce something less fatuous. Good evening, Miss Ray. I'm so glad to find you here, said Kinsey with perfect composure. I wonder if I might have a few moments of your time. I'll... I'll have to ask Captain Dubauer. He's very particular about visitors. So I've heard, smiled Kinsey. If it's about the birthday card, and I has put in evilly, I'm very sorry. I had a little trouble with my synthesizer. I sent it away for repairs. Perhaps I can make it up to you somehow. That unsettled him slightly. Uh, no problem. I certainly hope you may. You need not bother your host if you prefer. I don't wish to inconvenience so famous a man. If you come down to the gate, I can finish my business in a moment. I'll bet you can, thought Anias. She smiled brightly. Just a moment, please. I put him on hold. Chalmers, she wailed on a dead run. A 50-yard dash brought her to the kitchen where Chalmers was annoying his cook by his nightly habit of kibitzing. End quote. I really do admire the amount of tension and excitement that Lois has managed to evoke in this segment of the story, which also happens to be my favorite part and what I believe makes the story worth reading. Lois has done such a good job of painting Chalmers as this kind of badass that as a reader, I'm like, I don't know what this guy is going to do, but I bet it's going to be good. But then, right as the energy of the story is building up to its peak, Lois uses another one of her favorite words from the series, but which may be one of my least Kibitzing. Kibitzing, or to kibitz, comes from the Yiddish, and it means to offer unwanted advice or criticism, to be a busybody, so like what I'm doing on this podcast. I know that there is an argument to be made that words in other languages that have no direct translation but which convey a specific mix of emotions or memes are fair game as far as selection for use in narration. Ennui and schadenfreude are classic examples of such words but I believe that they also come with their own connotations usually regarding the person using those words that the writer might not want associated with their narrative voice. In the first episode of this podcast, I described Anias as in a state of artistic ennui. I chose this word not only because it does describe a specific combination of emotions that I felt applied to Anias' character, but also because of the association with being overly self-serious that I believe goes with it meaning that the negative emotions are of a superficial nature. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't really be concerned about the mental health of somebody who told me, I'm in a state of ennui right now. And I wouldn't use it myself because if I was in enough emotional distress to feel the need to share it with another person, I don't think it would be possible to communicate the gravity of my negative emotions with such a word as ennui. So back to kibitzing. Yes, kibitzing does have a meaning that is appropriate for its usage in this story, but... And I am Jewish from a Yiddish-speaking family, in case that somehow has an influence on the credibility of my argument. But the common association with the casual usage of Yiddish words mixed in with English is that of some kind of comical content, where either the topic of Judaism or Jewish culture is a subtext for the humor. I will admit, I might be seeing more Borst Belt subtext here than others might, but without at least some exposure to that culture, which exists in popular culture mostly in the form of humor, a reader wouldn't really understand what that word meant anyway. The main point I'm trying to make is that I find it distracting, and even more so since Lois is so excellently building up tension and excitement for the confrontation 
with Kinsey in this section of the story. I believe in later books she uses kibitzing in the form of dialogue, and that too I find distracting, but it could also be argued that those connotations would have been lost in the course of time within that character's context. Back to the story. When Anais reaches Chalmers, she says, quote, He's here at the front gate. Kinsey himself wants to see me. Yes, I know, said Chalmers, dipping his finger into a sauce. He's been skulking around the perimeter of the foreskin for about an hour now. Guess he's given up on sneaking in and has decided to risk a frontal assault. Anais glared at him. You knew and didn't tell me? It wasn't the right time of day yet, he said mildly. What'll we do? Well, you may go to the phone and call Sheriff Yoder. Ask him to stop by in about an hour. Then wait in the study. Charles, hold dinner for one hour. That should be sufficient. End quote. Okay, Lois is back on track here, building tension and anticipation. Confirming that yes, Chalmers is a badass, that he has had everything under control this whole time, and his cryptic mention of the right time indicates the existence of an even more elaborate plan, a further piece of which he reveals when he asks Anais to phone his neighbor the sheriff and ask him to stop by in an hour. All this setup is laid down so well by Lois, and she has done such a good job at making us want so badly to have Kinsey get his comeuppance dished out by Thomas that she may have done her story a slight disservice because we all know Kinsey's about to get it and get it good, the element of dread and tension gets washed out. Emotionally, we are left only with excitement, which is not a trivial emotion for an author to evoke, and I think that Lois's own excitement in writing this part of the story and being caught up with it as she wrote it comes right off the page. Quote, Ooh, Anais danced around him like a small, impatient moon about a Jovian planet. What are you going to do? I'm going to take our visitor for a walk. All right, be like that, complained Anais bitterly. But be careful. I'm always careful. You agreed to leave this part to me, remember? He walked out the house and towards the main gate in the failing light. End quote. For some reason, this image of Anais skipping around Chalmers squeaking, What are you going to do? has become the most enduring one that comes to mind when I think of this story. It really just sums up the sense of excitement I mentioned earlier, but also literally asks the question we all want to know. But I also have a problem with the scene, and it has to do with the emotional inconsistency in Anais' character and the undermining of the gravity of the situation which results in the elimination of dread. This is what I was talking about earlier when I was saying that her character's emotions don't seem consistent, seem consistent within a scene. The scene Lois has written to be very exciting and she is excited, but also inconsistent when thinking about the actual story so far. It's like the stakes are high, but you know the Roadrunner can tempt fate as much as he wants and he'll still outsmart the coyote. Lois has made this scene exciting, and it makes sense in the scene that Anais would be excited, and it's a fun little image of her dancing around like it's Christmas morning. But ask yourself in the larger context of the story, if the person who just attempted to brutally kill you showed up at your front door, would Christmas morning really be the emotion you would feel, no matter what assurance of safety and justice were given? Remember way back in the first episode, I made a big deal about how Lois is misdirecting us with the Kinsey character? but not even in the way we would typically be misdirected? What I was talking about first starts to become clear at the beginning of the scene where Chalmers confronts Kinsey. This is really just brilliant writing by Lois. She very obviously paints Kinsey as this dastardly villain capable of anything, it seems, cunning and devious. And we are meant to think that there is more to this character than face value. That is the typical misdirection. Ooh, he's actually a bad guy, or ooh, he's actually working for somebody else both of which are plot points that Lois does almost nothing to hide. But take that picture of cunning and dispassionate cruelty in a fine black suit and drop that person in the middle of the woods. All of a sudden, they don't seem that scary. The image described earlier of Kinsey tripping over roots as he tries to sneak onto Chalmers' property starts to show Kinsey's true colors. This next description fills those colors in a little darker. As Chalmers approaches Kinsey, who is waiting outside the main gate, we get... Quote, Kinsey was waiting by it, the gate, leaning against the pylon, scuffing a little pile of dirt about with the tip of one pointed shoe. End quote. This image of Kinsey absently kicking dirt around in his dress shoes is one of the first glimpses we get of Kinsey acting naturally, and the description we get of Kinsey's body language is similar to that of a nervous child. 
interesting because Lois also infantilizes Anais' physicality as well in the dancing scene. Lois's use of subtext in these dialogue exchanges is so clever. Each line of dialogue has multiple meanings based on what each character knows or thinks they think they know about each other. This exchange of dialogue continues as Chalmers walks with Kinsey further and further into the forested areas of his property. Lois never describes this, but she has done such a good job of setting up these characters, settings, and subtext that I can just picture Kinsey's getting more and more nervous as they go deeper into the grounds and it becomes clearer that they are not actually going to meet Anias. It reminds me of a scene in a mafia film when one of the characters slowly realizes that they are being driven to their execution and not to check out the new hall of fur coats or something. Finally, Chalmers breaks the pretense. Quote, That's probably far enough, Mr. Kinsey. I wouldn't want you to get lost. Chalmers arranged his equipment neatly to hand besides him on the log. He's got a control box for the force screen with him and a uh, tape recorder of some kind, audio recorder. Back to the book. Kinsey whirled, suspicion flaring in his face. What is this? His eyes flicked over Chalmers and, discovering nothing that looked like a weapon, started back towards him. He ran abruptly into a tingling, invisible wall of the forescreen and fell back but kept his head. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> What's the trouble, Captain? No trouble, said Chalmers genially. I just think you might like to talk to me. He tapped the recorder suggestively. What about? asked Kinsey, feeling uncertainly for some solid orientation. I thought I could leave that up to you, said Chalmers. I'm sure you'll think of something to interest me after a time. A long silence fell between them. End quote. And the trap is sprung. Kinsey is stuck outside the forescreen. And what else is outside the forescreen? We quickly begin to understand why Chalmers was waiting for a specific time of day. Once again, I want to point out how excellently Lois set all this up because this whole type of scene, the showdown or confrontation, is something that I will categorize as classic Bujold. I know it seems like a really general type of thing to try and jam under such a specific heading, but I just feel that there is something quintessentially Lois about these kinds of events in her books. She's just so good at them, and I feel a very similar sense of excitement with a little better seasoning of dread and stakes in the rest of her work in the series, as I do in this story. I guess it comes down to Lois really likes to make her characters squirm on the hook. The Lois squirm. This first story really is a rough preview of so many elements in the series. Chalmers begins to fill Kinsey in on just how bad his situation is. Quote, Just to jog your invention, I might point out a few salient features of your situation, Chalmers said helpfully. I should think you were quite careful to let no one know where you were going. You are now alone, without transportation, afoot in a strange country, with night falling. It is at least eight kilometers to the nearest neighbor, forgive me if I neglect to mention in which direction, through some rather uneven terrain, underbrush, swampy area, and so on. Very confusing in the dark. You strike me as a city man. I wonder how long it's been since you've hiked eight kilometers. Kinsey glared malignantly, but said nothing. Down the line, the first mosquito of the evening sparked its death on the screen. Ah, and then there are the mosquitoes, Thomas went on smoothly. You who lived in the civilized south have no conception of the veracity of the insect life here in the wild that radiated north. Although it isn't true that they can drain a man of blood in fifteen minutes. You're insane, cried Kinsey, and drew an ugly little needle ray pistol from his jacket. Let me in, he demanded. Oh, dear. I hope you know your physics, said Chalmers, unmoved. The expression on Kinsey's face indicated he did. Lips compressed, he returned the needler to his pocket. Thank you, said Chalmers. Magnetic resonance is a powerful force. It would make an impressive crater about where you're standing. I suppose I could turn it into a goldfish pond. Still, you'd do well not to throw it away. You might need it later if you decide to take that hike. Woodchucks, you know. What are woodchucks? asked Kinsey, drawn in spite of himself. End quote. And now we have another first. The first future weapon, the needle ray pistol. From the Verkosigan Saga Concordance, we get a little more information. Quote, needle ray pistol. A small, concealable energy pistol. The character known as Kinsey pulls one on Chalmers Dubauer when he's trapped outside the energy screen, 
but he can't use it owing to some kind of magnetic resonance from the force screen that would overload the pistol power pack and make it explode, end quote. We're going to see later in the books that Lois loves really nasty future weapons. Although we don't get a description of exactly how powerful this weapon is, we do get an idea of the kind of forces in play when Chalmers alludes to the consequences of shooting an energy weapon at a force screen. This idea, part world building, part plot convenience, I can only guess is a reference to the same phenomenon which exists in the Dune universe. Also, there is another weapon in the Varkosaverse, a microscopic spoiler here, called a needle gun that appears recurrently in the rest of the series. Originally, I did a bunch of research on the engineering of such a gun before I realized that this was an entirely different type of weapon, so I'm going to save all that good stuff for when the needle gun comes up later in the series. Now we see Kinsey start breaking down. He's obviously scared but trying not to panic. Chalmers casually brings up that, quote, The mosquitoes, Chalmers went on didactically, locate their prey by detecting CO2 in mammalian exhalations. I suppose you could try to hold your breath. End quote. I'm sure Lois must have picked up this bit of information on her biological research trip to Africa. The sound of the mosquitoes getting closer finally causes Kinsey to panic, and he presses himself against the force screen. Lois writes this very nice piece of description here that really stuck with me. Quote, there was a nasty buzzing noise by Kinsey's head. With a cry, he whirled and batted the great insect into the screen where the detector program identified and annihilated it. He leaned against the force screen, which generated a golden aura around him, like the vision of a saint. End quote. For some reason, the way the force screen glows as you push it really grounds that technology in reality. Maybe it's like pressing your finger into your computer screen or modern television screen. It causes a little halo of distortion. Also, Lois very cleverly fills the possible plot hole and extreme public safety hazard of having an invisible force screen that is fatal on contact like it's been described to be so far with the mosquitoes. Kinsey begins pleading with Chalmers, arguing that leaving him outside the force screen was the same as murder. Quote, A curious, angry light appeared in Chalmers' gray eyes for just a moment, so that in spite of the mosquitoes, Kinsey fell back from the force screen as if aware for the first time of just what a large man his host seemed. End quote. Now that we've had our first physical contact with the mosquitoes, let's see what the Vercosigan Saga Concordance has to say about them. Quote, mosquitoes. After a global war, many earth animals were genetically altered. These new mosquitoes are about five inches long with powerful venom that would only take a few stings to kill a human. Chalmers traps the man known as Kinsey in the forest using the force screen and questions him about the commissioned feely dream while mosquitoes attack him. End quote. So, I guess this is going to be the one and only mention of mosquitoes in the Vorkosaverse, but I really think they make the most of it. As a last desperate attempt to save himself from revealing his true crimes, Kinsey makes up a nonsense story about Anias and him being involved in a relationship, but this only causes Chalmers to threaten to leave him there. Quote, Mr. Kinsey, I realize to you the universe seems to turn on your continued existence. Solipsism seems to be a common feature of of the criminal mind, but believe me, it is nothing to me. End quote. Okay. Solipsism is the philosophical idea that only one's mind is sure to exist. Lois emphasizes the word nothing in this dialogue by putting it in italics. I think she is pointing out here the thing that makes Chalmers so interesting and powerful as a character. He is, in a way, completely detached in the Anne Rice sense of the word. He is outside of the present world, both physically and psychologically. Now imagine explaining the complexities, convolutions, and superficial dramas that make up the current political state of our civilization to a man who has witnessed the rise and fall of many civilizations, much grander and seemingly everlasting than our own. Not read about it or even visited the ruins, but lived within it and then witnessed it being forgotten. What further evidence is needed that the universe goes on without you, not because of you? And what chance do the schemes of a man like Kinsey really have up against a man like Chalmers? Back to the story. Quote, Chalmers rose. The mosquitoes sang in the undergrowth. Kinsey broke. My name is Carlos Diaz, he cried, leaning against the screen. I was a private inquiry agent in Rio. Lost my license last year. It was a damn frame. Then this big executive in the Portobello Pharmaceutical Company, Dr. Bianca's his name, runs their development section. 
He offered me a thousand pesadoros to go to Miss Ray and get that dream made. Not to be traced to him, he gave me this laundered cash for her. Ow, ow, get it off me! He whirled around, hands clutching frantically at the little nightmare embedded in his back. Back against the screen, Jalmus advised. Kinsey Diaz did so and continued talking even faster. End quote. I really like that neat little moment when Mosquito bites Kinsey right between the shoulders so that he can't rip it off. Something about how Chalmers directs Kinsey to place his back against the screen just really stuck with me as having the manner and tone of an engineer. And now all of Kinsey's part of the mystery comes to light. Kinsey explains that he was a private investigator in Rio who had recently lost his license. Now working illicitly, he was hired for 1,000 pesadoros by a pharmaceutical company executive named Dr. Bianca to use laundered cash to buy an untraceable feely dream from Anias. And here we finally fully understand the misdirection Lois played with us about this character. It turns out that Kinsey came up with the idea to kill Anias all on his own in an attempt to keep the 20,000 pesadoros. To do this, he managed to use a contact at the Rio airport to get access to her dream synthesizer. Kinsey makes this admission of actually trying to kill Anias unintentionally as the poison of the mosquito bites begin to take effect. Could this be the first use of this truth serum theme? So who is the real Kinsey which Lois was hiding from us? A pervert? A hired killer? A mustache twisting villain? No. He's just a murderous screw up essentially. A victim of his own greed and incompetence in the end which all ends up undermining both Dr. Bianchi's plans for maintaining secrecy and his own for getting rich. Quote, Chalmers, his face shadowed in the darkness, studied Diaz in the faint glow of the screen and decided he was finally speaking the truth. For one thing, the story was not sufficiently self-serving to be made up. For another, the mosquito venom was starting to make his victims dizzy and ill, surely a bar to any very intricate fictionalization. Diaz had given him the lead that Anias, at least, most desired. Chalmers, relieved, put from himself the whispering lascivious temptation to revenge that had so mixed itself with the urgent need for information from the little creep before him. Self-righteous violence, however satisfying, was a luxury too rich for a servant of reality. End quote. I really love this line, servant of reality, and I think it refers back to the detachment I mentioned before. It's actually kind of aspirational too. I mean, shouldn't we all be servants of reality? Would the alternative be to be servants of delusion? I think that's what Kinsey was. Chalmers disarms the defeated Kinsey by having him drop his needle ray gun and adjusting the force screen to enclose it. Earlier in the story, Chalmers made the statement, quote, No, no, no guns. I suppose I can't blame you for not having the engineering point of view. There are weapons all around us, much better than guns. If you can get them up here, I think you'd better leave that part of it to me. End quote. Did you guys think he was talking about the mosquitoes in the force screen there? As an engineer, I really liked this quote, but I thought I should look a little closer at it now that Chalmers has shown us what he meant and now that his plan has unfolded. I am focusing on this because Lois seems to make a point that Chalmers' plan to handle this was from an engineering point of view. I really agree that my engineering education did change the way I think and solve problems, but I would be hard pressed to give you a detailed explanation. Let's look at some definitions of engineering. This definition is from the American Engineering Council for Professional Development. Quote, engineering. The creative application of scientific principles to design or develop structures, machines, apparatus, or manufacturing processes or works utilizing them singly or in combination, or to construct or operate the same with full cognizance of their design, or to forecast their behavior under specific operating conditions, all as respects an intended function, economics of operation, and safety to life and property. End quote. Okay, this was obviously written by an engineer, uh, a fact which can be easily discerned by the total lack of anything that looks like a definitive answer. I prefer the Britannica definition, quote, Engineering, the application of science to the optimum conversion of resources of nature to the uses of humankind, end quote. I have to mention that this definition is found under the subcategory of civil engineering, so that does kind of taint its credibility. But I think that... <laughs> 
Still, I think this definition does excellently capture what Chalmers did in this last scene. In the most literal sense, he applied the science of the force screen to optimize the conversion of natural resources, the mosquitoes, to the uses he wanted, which was to safely and successfully trap and interrogate Kinsey. Lois doesn't use words carelessly, except for Yiddish words. Chalmers walks the now poisoned and dazed Kinsey back to the house where Anias and the sheriff are waiting. Chalmers asks the sheriff to arrest him for trespassing and possessing an illegal weapon, but goes out of his way not to bring up the attempted murder confession. It seems like part of the plan that they are going to wait for the real police to press those charges. But I just don't know why Chalmers is protecting Kinsey at all. Yes, he did coerce the confession out of him, but Kinsey is a seriously dangerous man who is capable of organizing a conspiracy involving suborning an airport worker and rewiring complex organic electronics into a bomb, essentially. I think that the sheriff would want to know this kind of thing, and I also think Anaius would want the attempted murder to be out in the open as well. I get the feeling like Lois thinks the emotional closure for this character was supposed to be the fear and pain he experienced from the mosquito attacks. But really, this man was an extremely evil-intentioned person, regardless of his competence in executing those intentions. Therefore, it seems like he's getting off easy. After Chalmers explains the details about Dr. Bianca to Anais, she leaves to go back to Rio to confront him. This is Chalmers' exit from the story, and also from the Vercosa person, personally, if not genetically. I think at this point, the rest of the story is almost a foregone conclusion. As readers, we pretty much know all the details of the mystery, and so the pitfall of having the reader know more than the character comes into play here. The pitfall of, instead of creating tension and suspense, of creating kind of boredom and frustration. <laughs> and that's because the only question that really remains is whether the dream has already had its intended effect of causing its victim to commit suicide, and, if not, how will Anias get it back with no way of proving it was commissioned for ill intent? While this is an interesting question, we have to ask ourselves if it is interesting enough to carry the rest of the story, particularly because we just got a big emotional climax with the scene with Kinsey slash Diaz and Chalmers. And now we are almost having a duplicated scene between a person who is not as compelling character-wise, Anias, and a person who is not as dangerous, Dr. Bianca, because we now know he never wanted Anias to be killed. At this point in first reading this story, I was starting to get anxious that it would end soon. I wondered if Lois felt that the edge was gone from her narrative as well as she was writing these scenes, but just had to wrap it up in the name of finishing what she started. I can tell you, I am in a very similar state of mind regarding this episode of the podcast. When Anais gets back to Rio, she coordinates with the local police detective, Lieutenant Mendez, that was working on her case from before, to accompany her to the meeting she has set up with Dr. Bianca. Anais does some research about Dr. Bianca, and it turns out that his wife is the CEO of the Portobello Pharmaceutical Company. This provides a motive for Dr. Bianca. In a half-hearted attempt at justifying Dr. Bianca's ability to design a feely dream for his wife that would cause her to kill herself, Anais also finds that he has multiple degrees in chemistry and psychology. As far as the structure of a mystery goes, this final confrontation in the well-appointed home of the mastermind seems required. But I also feel that this scene helps reinforce the idea that Lois was just trying to wrap it up. First, Anais bumps into Mrs. Bianca on the stairway leading to her husband's home office. We get a description of somebody with a troubled mind, which would make sense after exposure to the feely dream. But then we get this totally unmotivated speech from Mrs. Bianca, where she assumes that Anais is some kind of business associate of her husband, and so, unprovoked, starts spilling all these details about the internal business conflict she and her husband are having. And then Mrs. Bianca is gone out of the story in a, quote, wake of perfume, end quote. Remember that Anais caused this whole international scheme in order to find and save this woman. So it seems kind of a waste when their meaning is only used as a clunky exposition dump. When Anais enters Dr. Bianca's office, he is surprised to see a police detective accompanying her. Again, we get a few nice lines of dialogue where each character is trying to feel each other out while not showing their hand, so to speak. Remember, Anais's goal is to get the Feely Dream back from him, not necessarily to get him to confess to anything. Because, besides the money laundering part of the story, Kinsey didn't and couldn't really implicate Dr. Bianca in anything more than wanting a custom Feely Dream. 
Once again, while the dialogue and character dynamics at play in this scene are well done, it suffers from having to follow a very similar scene in which both characters and stakes were of greater interest. Anais strikes the first verbal blow when she informs Dr. Bianca that Kinsey tried to murder her. This unsettles Dr. Bianca, but Anais doesn't reveal that Kinsey said anything about him. Instead, she goes back to her gambit of pretending ignorance. Quote, I'm returning the money you paid me. It's been endorsed, and you can redeem it at any branch of the state bank. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask for the dream back. There was an error in its execution. She waited breathlessly as he hung on the edge. If he denied all knowledge of the dream in front of the lieutenant, it might kill all chances of making him fork it over. Off balance, not knowing what Diaz might have said, he made the wrong move. I checked the dream myself, he said. You are perhaps being oversensitive to some little artistic problem. I assure you, I found it flawless. He pushed the check back towards her. Gotcha, she thought. She did not move. End quote. Trying to keep the pieces of his plan together, Dr. Bianca offers Anais twice the payment, but Anais claims that her artistic integrity demands she take the freely dream back. As a last-ditch effort, Dr. Bianca threatens to sue Anais for breach of contract, to which Anais replies, quote, that could be quite interesting, allowed Anias. The dream, of course, would have to be presented in court as evidence. The judge would have to view it, maybe some expert witnesses too. It would be examined quite closely, and then the publicity. I rather like publicity myself. It gets your name before the public, and people remember it. Should they see it again, in another context, say, they make connections. End quote. This counter threat of public exposure is too much for our villain, and he gives Anais back the master disc with the deadly feely dream on it. I guess there was some serious copy protection on it. After that, Anais leaves, and the detective presumably begins to question Dr. Bianca about the money laundering Kinsey mentioned. The last section of the story has Anais receiving her new feely dream synthesizer, which Thomas has bought for her. She sits down to begin working on her new feely dream, not the sequel to Triad, but a new story about Beta Colony for the juvenile field dream market. I guess this is some kind of character group. Okay, and that's it. Dreamweaver's Dilemma done. Honestly, the real victim in this story was Helmut Gonzalez. I mean, the poor guy has his own obligations. Anais has made him wait months past her deadline. What happened to good faith, you know? So, what can we take away from this story? What potential does it show for the aspiring Lois? In technical terms, it displays a solid grasp of plot structure and understanding of how to develop interesting characters applied with greater and lesser success, real skill in dialogue, and a natural ability in world building. As far as creativity goes, while incorporating technology involving the dream state is nothing new to sci-fi, the details of how that technology worked which Lois shares with us do demonstrate how much creative energy and thought she put into the functioning of this technology. Also, she speculates well about the second and third order effects that the emergence of any new technology will have on society. Besides the sci-fi concepts, the way she expresses her insight into the general human condition are truly compelling. Concepts like infusing the Feely Dream characters with burdens of ego or Chalmers describing himself as a servant of reality indicate just how deep the calm waters of Lake Lois really are, and, if I didn't know already, I would be very excited to see how she plums those depths in her later writing. I also want to point out the character of Kinsey in particular. Although Chalmers is obviously the more interesting character, Kinsey, I believe, is the most creative. This is because he really subverts your expectations of a villain. Yes, he was destroyed by his own flaws, a classic villain arc, but the flaw isn't greed, it's thinking that he was smarter than he was. It is common for villains to fail because they underestimate their opponents. It is much more rare for a villain to fail because they overestimate themselves. His willingness to do violence from a self-deluded perspective really makes him scary, I think, and seems closer to the true reality of violent people. Thematically, we are introduced to so many ideas and concepts that will play major roles in directing the series later on. As far as the Vercosaverse canon goes, we get the first mention of Beta Colony, the Dubauer family, wormhole travel, future fertility technology, brain to computer interfaces, sexual liberation and destigmatization, the word suborn, the mixing of the sci fi and mystery genre, and more. Speaking of the mystery subplot, in the last episode, I mentioned that I thought Lois had intentionally incorporated noir elements into this story. 
Once again, while doing research for this episode, I came across a quote from Lois in the answer section that applied to the last episode, where Lois talks about the mystery genre. Quote, next to science fiction, mystery is my favorite genre. Science fiction, fantasy, and mystery were what I read. The Sherlock Holmes stories, Dorothy L. Sayers, mostly British mysteries. I never got into hardball detective, but I love the British stuff. End quote. So after reading this, I went back to look at the noir elements identified, and I guess they could be interpreted through the Doyle Christie lens. The noir roles are not a perfect fit, but I still think it's more Marlowe than Poirot. Okay, all right. Just let that sink in. Let that sink in, what, what I just said there. Okay. Just think of Dreamweaver's Dilemma as a noir story, but from the perspective of the femme fatale, who is Anais. So not a perfect fit, but many similar structural elements. Usually, the femme fatale shows up at the PI's office at the beginning of the story with some kind of problem. In Dreamweaver's Dilemma, we actually see how she was lured into the problem situation. After the attempt on Anais's life, she goes to Chalmers' place, and this would be where the typical noir story would start. And to be honest, Chalmers is the, really the heart of this story. Everything that happens before his section is kind of okay as far as maintaining the reader's interest goes. The sci-fi concepts are cool, but the characters are not interesting enough to really carry the story. In Anais's case, she has created all the conflict in her life through her own inaction and breaking of agreements. In Kinsey's case, as far as we are shown in this part of the story, he is just a generic bad guy doing obvious bad guy stuff, and Anais's willingness to be taken in by him creates an internal struggle in the reader as to whether this person is worth caring about if they act so much against their own self-interest. After Thomas leaves the story, we get a similar dynamic where Anais is pretty much playing out the story to its obvious conclusion and her adversary is not only weak, but already in a state of near checkmate before the confrontation really starts. In effect, this whole last part of the story could have been told with just one line from Thomas. I'll send the information about Dr. Bianca for the real police to start digging into. Yes, the plot point about recovering the dream before it causes its user to commit suicide would have not been tied up, but the way it was actually tied up in the story didn't really do it much favors anyway. Really, I think this story would have been a great way to start a series about Chalmers, the reluctant detective trying to hold on to his past but incapable of escaping the world of his future when people need his help. It could have been a whole thing. As far as how this story fits into the Vorkosiverse, I think it needs to be read, particularly if you have already read a bunch of Lois's work. I think that a big part of the reason I liked this story so much when I first read it was because I could identify all these reverse Easter eggs, I guess, from the later stories. The only place I think it really breaks continuity with the later Borcosifers is in the concept of organic electronics. There are a few references to the technology of the Borcosifers among the various reference materials I consult, and as far as I can see, no mention of organic electronics are made. If I had to ask Lois one question about the story, it would be her thoughts process behind this concept. As far as what Lois thinks of this story, the fact that it is not included on her suggested reading order for the Varkosigan saga should be some indication. The way she references it in her interviews mostly as the novelette, which she wrote at the beginning of her writing career, is another. And then there are a few quotes, like this one, from the answer section of the Dreamweaver's Dilemma collection. Quote, so I started with the novelette and sent it off to Lillian for critique, and she sent it on to Patricia Reed in Minneapolis, who sent me back this wonderful 14-page letter of comments on my novelette. You've got it in the book here, the one with Chalmers and Anias, Dreamweaver's Dilemma, unrevised, I'm afraid, but it's a little slice of my history. End quote. I really want to know what was in that letter and if there was any overlap between Reed's critiques and my own. Also, I would really like to know what revisions Lois would make. Well, maybe one day we'll get a chance to find out. And here's another little piece of trivia about the short story's first publication, which comes from a correspondence between Lois and the mod for the Verkosigan Book Club on Reddit. Quote, When, in the mid-90s, the SF convention Boscone, at which I was writer, guest of honor, was putting together their traditional survey book of unpublished or other oddments from their GOHs, I didn't have many pieces of unpublished work, as I had done very few short stories after I turned pro, and they'd all eventually sold except for the very first novelette, Dreamweaver's Dilemma. Scraping the barrel, I found the typescript of that fan story missing its last page and added it just to help fluff things up. End quote. So, interesting she referred to her own work in her own universe as a fan story there. That's why I wanted to bring attention to that quote. So that's it. We did it. 
And next, we'll start on the first full-length novel in the internal chronological order of the Varkosigan saga, but which was actually the fourth novel Lois wrote, Falling Free. So, with that to look forward to, please do the stuff the other recording of my voice suggested to do on social media, and I will see you all next time on the far side of the wormhole nexus.